we could yeah, kind of turn to the work you're doing at Rejuvenate Bio. And you're currently running a trial with um, dogs. I, I think you, you ran like a, a lab-based trial and now you're kind of looking at um, companion dogs. Uh, yeah, the first step was to show that we could translate our therapies from mice to, to dogs. And we were able to show uh, a very large amount of safety and expression of our therapies in dogs. So we were able to easily translate these therapies to dogs. Um, one of the best proof of concept uh, things that we thought we should go after is treating heart failure in dogs. So dogs develop mitral valve disease. Um, about 10% of all dogs have some form of heart failure. About 7% of dogs have mitral valve disease and mitral valve disease is primarily a small dog disease. And there are even particular breeds of small dogs, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels that have upwards of 80% uh, of the of the population getting this mitral valve disease. And um, since we saw such amazing data across numerous different diseases in mice, the heart failure, kidney failure, diabetes, and obesity, uh, we decided to choose the heart failure indication because it was one of the largest unmet needs that um, was a life-threatening problem. Uh, and we thought we would have uh, some really great results there based on our mouse data. And so we started this pilot study through Tufts University where we were treating people's pets with mitral valve disease. And um, we're seeing some preliminary results that are very promising in those dogs. Uh, most importantly, uh, we have these therapies in dogs out to two and a half years, close to three years now, and haven't seen a single negative side effect. And the um, very promising efficacy data as well that I'm not yet able to share, but... Very okay. exciting. Okay. And this is with RGBO1, which is FGF beta and TGF beta inhibitor. It's yeah, FGF, FGF 21. 21. And uh, TGF beta receptor 2. Yeah, TGF yeah. beta 1. Exactly. Okay. So how does it... So how does it actually help with the mitral valve disease? Because that seems to be like a, a, a disease of kind of reconfiguration of the heart in some way that it... it um, so how does like this protein coming out of the liver actually change that? Does it just make the heart younger? Yeah. So like I said, we're, we're trying to re-regulate gene expression profiles. And one of the things diseases do really well is create a large inflammatory environment and activate uh, pleiotropic pathways that when activated too long, create scar tissue damage that creates this downward cycle in lots of different disease states. So we try to re-regulate the gene networks, specifically with FGF21 and TGF beta receptor 2, to stop this downward cycle. They mainly interfere on fibrosis development, which we showed in our mouse model of heart failure, um, uh, about a 75% reduction in uh, fibrotic development in that mouse heart, uh, heart failure model. And uh, FGF21 promotes mitochondrial biogenesis, as well as secondary effects in vascularization and heart health and decreasing um, uh, um, inflammatory environment as well. So they both interact on the inflammatory environment and uh, FGF21 also helps the muscle tissue in your heart function better. And um, that not only is the case for mitral valve disease, that is also the case for the mouse model of heart failure that we used uh, for the paper, which was a ascending aortic constriction, which, mim which mimics systemic hypertension. Uh, so imagine you had high blood pressure your whole life. That's what this mouse model that we used in the paper was. And we've recently um, done some work in a new mouse model for ARVC, which is our first human indication for RJBO1. Uh, ARVC is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And so if you see these young people on basketball courts um, falling dead from their heart stopping, that's most likely this disease. Uh, the, they have misfirings and arrhythmias in their hearts that um, confuses the heart and, and sometimes it can have this sudden cardiac arrest situation. And so uh, ARVC, MVD, mitral valve disease, and uh, ascending aortic constriction, the systemic hypertension, they're all three very different diseases with very different etiologies, but they all have similar underlying pathologies in that they get lots of fibrosis, have an inflammatory environment, 
have a lot of damage and the heart eventually re uh, tries to compensate and can't and uh, eventually uh, has heart failure. So we work on that common pathological level where we're decreasing fibrosis and increasing heart function across all three of these different diseases uh, where we're having really promising results in the uh, MVD and ARVC space, as well as the one that's published for ascending aortic constriction. Do you look at other markers, either in, in the original paper or, or in the dogs? It's kind of other markers of aging, uh, like uh, obesity, but, but also, have you ever looked at epigenetic age? We have not looked at epigenetic age. Um, I think it is a good tool. I do. I think it has not been proven to be a perfect biomarker of uh, or readout for your actual chronological or biological age. I think it is very promising, and I look forward to uh, having it uh, be used as a surrogate biomarker for aging in general. But uh, we haven't used that tool yet to measure that in our animals. Um, the owners that uh, have received our treatment thus far, and we foresee using uh, the therapy in, in uh, pet parents, uh, they're very passionate. And so uh, I think they would be amenable to many year long follow-ups, uh, but generally in the field, that's uh, something that's pretty hard to do is have these really long-term follow-ups with uh, patients uh, once they have a one and done therapy, which is what AAV is, which is nice. Yeah, I was going to ask that. So, so in the trial, it is like just you just inject the dogs one time and then follow up or, or not as as the opportunity. Try to follow up as much as possible. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's a single injection intravenously. Uh, you can go uh, to any vet, any vet tech could do this, and uh, they just inject the therapy slowly over the course of five to ten minutes, and that would be good enough for greater than twelve years. Wow. Uh, roughly how many, can you say, how many dogs are currently part of the trial? Um, yes. Well, I, yeah. Uh, we've injected approximately 15 dogs, people's right. pets. And, I mean, do you have a target? Uh, are you still kind of recruiting? Um, we put recruiting on hold for a little while. Uh, but for now, you know, just reassessing the data, we might open it back up. But for now, uh, we put a hold on recruiting more dogs into the study. Right. And these are all this, there's one breed, this uh, King Charles Spaniel. The majority of the dogs are Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, but we do have some non-calves in the study as well. Okay. So, so you, you have a dog. Is he part of the trial? No, I, <laughs> I, did, have, I did have a dog. Uh, oh, really? He passed, passed away oh. last year. Um, he had a different genetic disease, <laughs> uh, degenerative myelopathy. So it was very unfortunate. Oh, okay. Um, okay, and, oh, so when do you see that for for animals, this would become like a commercially available uh, therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're aiming to be on the market in 2024, conditionally approved. Um, this, there's something that's called expanded approval in uh, the animal health space where if you have a life-threatening disease and you're able to show a reasonable expectation of efficacy and safety, that you're able to get something called conditional approval. Um, and that's what we're aiming for by 2024.